are in week number four of this message series called Sound Mind, where we are looking at Jesus and the Bible and mental health. And I know we've been looking at this. I know sometimes messages like this or series like this are a little bit challenging because they're, they're more teaching than preaching. And I, I encourage you in that, like to, to have the discipline of keeping your heart in a place where you can be taught the word of God as well. That when it becomes about like a preference, even in what we're hearing, we, we turn the worship service into entertainment. And that's not what we're here for. That it's important to have the discipline of being a disciple, a disciplined follower to where we can receive instruction. It is one of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit that he would teach us, right? Come on, am I hearing me? He would teach us all things. And so I mean, it's important that we would, again, resist flesh when it wants to kind of wiggle out from this. Like, yeah, okay, we'll get we'll something else. And, and, and allow it because I, I know that the Lord is working through it. And so I trust uh, that, again, we stay in the position we can get restless. And I'm just encouraging you to, to stay in that realm where the Lord can bring instruction. That it's great to sometimes just have it line upon line as he uses it. And, and even though we will uh, we'll do some study from outside, it's all rooted in the word. And, and here's the revelation I got that a sound mind is all about our identity in Christ. Yeah. That it really is, the, it is the, the part of living the life that he paid a full price for. And so I, when we're talking about a sound mind that he came, that he would, he, that's the part of that abundant life that he gave his life for, that we would have a sound mind, that we would not have fear, but we have power, love, and a, and a sound mind. So I'm going to encourage you to, again, just, just press in there. And plus, it's one of these working things here. And the other part about the analogy is anybody ever seen one of those, anybody has a really organized garage with all the tools? Anybody seen those people? I'm not one of them. That's why I say those because I am not one of them. But they have all, I mean, all the tools that are there. And I mean, it's so nice. And, and all the craftsman drawers. And I'm, everything's so neatly put away. I mean, it's just, it, it has to make you, it'll actually make you covet. Right? <laughs> and what's amazing, though, is that as much as you see all those tools and, and it's nicely put away, the thing that is about that is that is not the, the, the absolute intent of what those tools are for. While they are in that garage and hanging very neatly, they are still in a place of potential. But they are not in a place of fulfillment. And so while it's crazy, though, but sometimes like that's what we do. We admire potential and don't realize that there's fulfillment. And when we are looking at this series, I'm encouraging you like you've been given and going to be given tools that are meant to be used. And if you don't apply them, you're that garage that's got all the stuff nicely lined up, but that's only potential, and you can't achieve everything the Lord has for you in potential. It's application. It's it's using it. And I'm telling you, if, if no one else is, I'm learning, I'm having to apply the very things we're talking about in this season as well that it's going to take that, and as you're coming and, and the things that we're facing, you're going to have to learn how to press in so that you can live in that place of, of your Christ-like identity and not live from a place of, of biblical potential. Jesus didn't die for potential. He said, it will be finished. No, he said, it is finished. He, it is a finished work. He didn't die and leave potential. He died for fulfillment. Come on, you're with me this morning. Yeah. So right where you are, we just put your hand right over your heart, right where you are, and just, just pray with me. Father, I am ready to receive what you're going to speak to my heart. I'm ready to receive, Lord God. There's distractions, there's everything else, but Lord, right now I'm focused. I'm ready to receive what you would speak to my heart today. That today I'd, be, I'd look more like you today than I did yesterday. Because the reality and the truth of your word, which cannot return to you void, and I give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in today. We have started talking out. We, first week, we talked about the myths about mental health. Two weeks ago, then we talked about overcoming. Say overcoming. Overcoming, overcoming anxiety. We were just going to talk about it, but we're going to talk about being an overcomer. Why are we talking about overcoming? Because that's one of the words the Lord uses to describe you. You are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. So we're talking about overcoming anxiety. Last week, we talked about overcoming burnout, right? And today, I want to talk with you about overcoming relational wounds, relational wounds. 
We are starting today then with Adam and Eve and the original sin, that, that sin of disobedience, which they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which the Lord told them not to. And now they have a revel- revelation of good and evil. And now they realize they have committed evil. And this is where we join it in Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 8. And the Bible says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And I want to start right here. And this is not really part of the message, but I I really need to, to start right here and pause right here. Because this is very much the root of where some of us very are spiritually is this place of like when we feel like we break fellowship with the Lord because of our sin, like there's a thing, and I'm not sure where it came from or where we've heard it, maybe it's been taught or just human nature, but we feel like when we sin, God wants nothing to do with us. But we look right here where the Lord absolutely, where they have sinned, and, and, and trust me, God wasn't like out for his, his, his walk in the cool of day and realized, wait a minute, something's wrong. I smell sin in the house. He knew before he ever started that they sinned because he's all-knowing. Anybody believe that? So all-knowing God, knowing that they had messed up, when he could have sent his voice, he still chose to send his presence. And it's the very same thing for you that when you mess up, God is not looking to throw you off and like, you smell like this, I can't be around you. But from the very beginning, he's letting you know that when you mess up, I will still come after you. And this is a place where we have this fear, where we've built this thing almost like when I'm in sin, like I'm disgusting to God, whether it's shame or or anger or whatever that would be. But I want to be very clear. God is very clear about his reputation that even when they sinned, I still went looking for them. And I asked one really important question. Where are you? The first question he asked, now, what did you do? Where are you? Something has caused a separation between us. Where are you? Well, somebody in the room, he's asking you that question, been yelling that question for years. Where are you? You keep trying to fix your actions, and he's trying to fix your location. Where are you? From the very beginning, he was clear that this this relational issue, this was a relationship issue. They had broken fellowship. They had broken relationship with him. And what was more important with him was not the actions, but the relationship. Where are you? What have you done to us? Come on, is anybody hearing this? Are you still with me this morning? This is why. So why are our relationship, uh, 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 relational wounds important to talk about? Because everything about our lives comes back to relationships, everything. And so I think it's really important for us because we hear relational wounds. We kind of have an understanding, but let's, let's get a very clear one. Let's take the binoculars and dial them in a little bit, and let's start with defining what relational wounds are. Relational wounds are, this is in your notes, are, are emotional, psychological, or spiritual injuries that occur in the context of relationships. One more time, relational wounds are emotional, psychological, or spiritual injuries that occur in the context of relationships. These wounds often result from a negative experience with people that we are close to, like family members, friends, spouses, or even members of our own faith communities. Relational wounds. And the crazy fact about relational wounds, this next one that's in your note, is that past hurts still hurt. Relational wounds, past hurts still hurt. Things that we've done or things that have been done to us still hurt. This is this, this place right here where you, you hear that. Relational wounds also remind us that there is a risk to loving because you can be deeply hurt. It reminds you that if you love, that you can be deeply hurt. C.S. Lewis puts it like this, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. 
Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. So he's saying, like, build a wall, build your safe place, but you'll change your heart from a heart to something else. Vulnerability. And I want to be very, very clear that Jesus is God's overwhelming encouragement and endorsement that it's worth the risk to lean into love. Amen. He's our living example of God saying it's worth the risk. It's worth the risk. Can you all hear me this morning? So I want to take you on a path. I promise you we're going to land and just let me walk you through because I'm going to give you a a, a lot of information. Uh, You're going to need it because it's just going to build and and we're going to let the Lord build the house today. Is that okay? And so I want to start then with the sources of relational wounds, identifying those. And amazing enough, maybe you all would expect it. The number first one is our parents. Our parents are a source of, of relational wounds. One, one of the biggest ones I had was with my dad. I remember when he said what he said. I remember exactly what he said. I remember hating him right after he said it for many years. And, and so those relational wounds, like that relational wound was absolutely real with my dad. And, and, and for years, like it was so bad because I hated him so badly because of it that it began and shaped my whole life from that relational wound. Why? I, I, got, I, went and I went to college not first to learn. I went to college to be better than him. I got a degree because, one, I didn't want to be poor and I didn't want to be like him. I even once almost changed my name because I didn't want to be anything like him because I was so mad at what he said to me. Was it hurtful? For sure. I absolutely was just absolutely just just furious with him. Then, then I went further and got other degrees, not because of opportunity, but, but primarily because I wanted to be better than him. Because what I wanted him to do is say that he was sorry for whatever he said. That was the root of everything that was that I'm looking at the tree, but the root of it was, I want you to regret the day you ever said that to me. Can you hear me this morning? Can you hear me? Parents can be the source of those relational wounds. And I, I, it took years to come to the place of realizing that every, what you're chasing, hey, the Lord's already given you. Relational wounds. Here's the second one it is family. Say family. So the first one is parents. Did you know like the second most impactful relationship in a child's life up to the age of 15 is their grandparents? And so it's really, really important. Family. Third most impactful relationship in a child's life is their peers. So that's why it's really important, parents, for you to know their friends and for their friends to know you and for their friends to know what you're not going to put up with and what you're going to check on. And, 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 and we, didn't, we didn't come to any parents. parents. Your job is not to be friends with their friends. Your job is a parent. So we don't compare. I don't really care what other people do. This is our house. Freedom starts when you move out. This is how it goes in our home. You're, you don't have a cell phone? Sure don't. My parents are not giving you a cell phone. That's just how that goes. You don't have a job. So no, you get what we give you. But we're not trying to be, hey, parents, are we still good? We're still good because we're all parents. We got a parent. We love them, but, but we're going to parent. And it's important. Our, I want our, I want, we want to be the house that our friends, their friends love coming to. But it's going to be very clear that, you know, Gabriel Hill has parents. And I'll tell you, if you do it well, it does. It reaps benefits. You can love them and you don't crush them. Can I tell you what was really cool is a couple years ago, Sammy and Mike are both in school. Uh, it, is, it is Christmas. And both of them, for whatever reason, make friends with international students. And so it's just awesome to see. So Christmas came and, and it was cool. They came and said, Hey, can we bring our friends to the house for Christmas? Hey, that's a win. That's a win. And so we had, so actually, I think Samuel brought his friends home for Thanksgiving. I remember that because we, we said prayer, we got ready to eat. And so we're kind of like, you know, Nisa and I are kind of shuffling around. And, and Samuel comes up, he's like, uh, uh, Dad, can you, can you all come back in the, the dining room? He said, and I said, looking at everybody's just standing around, all his friends standing around the table. And he's like, so they're kind of, look for you to kind of explain what all the stuff is because they just hadn't experienced an American Thanksgiving. The coolest thing, the coolest thing. I'll tell you, it sounds very, it, 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 I promise you, if you do it right, they'll come back home. Okay? 
me encourage you. The third one then is our spouse. Uh, Pastor Mark Clark, in his message when I studied this, he said, the pain and pleasure of our lives tend to come from the same people, our spouse there. And we have, we have the potential to hurt the most from this person. And, and we got to remember our words have power, especially men. Like it's important for us to remember our words impact our wives in ways that, that we don't even know. And so it's really important. And so even though, and, and again, I'm speaking this because I'm a husband, right? And so I'm just talking. I, I want to be clear. Like you got to be careful what you say because you cannot unsay it. You can apologize and you can ask for forgiveness, but you still struck them and there's still a wound there. And trust me, what Satan loves to do is point that wound out to them and draw conclusions based upon that wound. And so I'm encouraging you like that one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, but because is it really worth what you're going to say? Because you cannot unsay it. Well, Guys, you still with me? We still good? Yeah. Okay, just, just, just being very, very straight with us. Here's this next one is friendships, like studies. And what, what's crazy about friendships, what's interesting is uh, studies amongst pastors reveal that they mourn the most. What they mourn the most is the loss of relationships in relationship to COVID over politics, policy, and ideological preference. Pastors are depressed because they lost relationships during that terrible season. And it doesn't matter whether you believe it's real or not, here's the real impact that's happening because you're seeing now younger people are not answering the call to ministry because they want nothing to do with it. And so you're ending up with pastors having to serve longer than maybe the time that they should because there's nobody else there to come behind them. Very real stuff. Real effects that have happened. Here's this last one then. Are the world and our community. These are sources of relational wounds. And then there are, they end with those sources, and there are common types of relational wounds. So these sources lead to certain types. And the first one is betrayal. Say betrayal. It's when someone we trust deceives us or abandons us and leaves us with this deep sense of hurt and loss. The second type of relational wound is rejection or abandonment. Uh, This feeling unloved or unwanted or left behind can create emotional scars that impact our future relationships. And now you begin to see where these relational wounds now begin to affect our future, where the seeds of this now begin to produce in the not good way. And so now because of rejection or abandonment, now it's how I see every relationship. And it especially ends up this way when we start talking about things as sensitive enough as race and culture. So now one person that didn't look like me did me this way, and so now they're all evil. Or one person we saw did something, and now they're all criminals. Or they all think like that. Or they're all poor. Or they all only have babies. Or they're all blonde-haired, blue-eyed devils. Or they're all only in jail. Yeah, because I'm coming right to your front porch because we're going to deal in truth. Because I'm not going to sit here and play the game. We're going to tell it like it is because we're going to be the church that Jesus wants us to be, or you're going to find where your gift needs to be used somewhere else. But we are not going to be vested in lying and putting on masks and not being truthful about who it is and allowing the Lord to transform us to look more like Jesus. We're not going to hide in the garden, and his presence is there. We're going to come right out. I'm naked. I did it. I messed up. Can you fix me? Because it's in all of us. We're not going to look more like Jesus and and still got our world stuff carrying in our back pocket. We got to let it go, and we got to face what he has for us. And the rejection and abandonment begins to form how, and here's the crazy part. We put it on God. God is not a bigger, better human being. Scripture says he's nothing like us. As far as heavens are from the earth, his ways are not our ways. Come on, can you hear me this morning? Is this making sense at all? Then now it begins, and it, and, and it begins to impact our future relationships. So now we go in, and we can't really connect with people. We, we, we ration ourselves. And so we don't know what it's like to enter wholly. So we got a plan B from day one. 
because of rejection issues, abandonment issues. The third one then is miscommunication or misunderstanding. Conflicts that arise from being misunderstood or being misjudged can result in feelings of frustration or isolation. This can happen so easily where we feel misunderstood and now all of a sudden nobody understands us. Nobody likes us. I just don't fit. And so we begin to isolate. Now we become even more vulnerable. The fourth one then is unmet expectations. Disappointment in relationships where our needs or expectations are not fulfilled. And now this leads to resentment or discouragement. And this is especially dangerous for marriages because you could have difficulty, but when that difficulty turns into resentment, it can be the poison pill for a marriage. And you have to really watch and guard against resentment. You really have to, again, daily do the warfare of fighting and saying, Father, keep my heart from getting resentful. Resentful is then, what does it look like? It's when you're having another conversation with your spouse in your head, but you're not saying anything. So they're saying something, but you're saying something back to them. You're arguing back with them, but you're not saying anything. Resentment. And resentment is where in your heart you now begin to devalue them in your own eyes. And your talk sounds like, you used to be so caring. When did you become so selfish? When did you get, I don't even know who you are. This begins to be the talk of what resentment sounds like in our own hearts, our own minds. And eventually, resentment then comes out of our mouth. And then we act on it. And so it's so important that you guard against resentment, especially when it's from unmet expectations. That some of that is even in feeling whether your expectations are real or have you made them clear or have you had to talk about expectations. But when they're unmet, it can breed resentment and it is extremely, extremely dangerous. The fifth then is judgment or condemnation. This is being judged harshly or unfairly by others while openly, whether openly or subtly, can, can deeply wound our sense of worth. So now I'm judged. Now all of a sudden I don't feel like I'm, I even belong in the room. I don't belong at the school. I don't belong on the team. I don't belong here. And I'm encouraging you, like, this is amazing how this thing can start as a kid and it carries into your adult life. And so the Lord will get you someplace and yet you don't feel worthy like you got there by luck as opposed to the Lord put you in the room. Hey, I promise you, whether David felt like being the king or not, he was called to be there. Yeah, Yeah, I know. Someone's like, God, David was called to be king. And some of us are called not to be kings. You got to love where the Lord calls you and got to know where he places you. You belong there because he said so. For years, I served as the worship pastor here, um, and I could not play an instrument. And, and so, like, there were, there were seasons, and you have incredibly talented people around you with Mike Burns and Keith Scott at that time and uh, different ones, Jeff Bauer, and, and the ones that the Lord has allowed me to work with, Daniel Mendenhall and, and Randy uh, Price. I mean, diff- just different ones and, and singers. Like, I mean, I could name them all. It's amazing. And so you, you got all these talented people in here. You can't play an instrument. And so there, there was a season where, like, you really, like, I had to get a grip on being secure, Because if not, what you're going to do is because you have a certain level of ability, you'll think like you have to be the most like the most informed one. So you'll kind of try and consistently keep pushing people down. You just got to let them soar, and you got to know who you are, and and you have to just I had to just resolve in my heart that I had been charged with leading this very talented team. And when it came down to it, whether I was the most talented or not, that's not what qualified. And what qualified me, I was called to do it. And this is where you have to rest in that. You have to know, hey, I'm, this is what I'm called to do, and you got to rest in that. I may not be the most talented at it, but right now I, I'm right because I'm final. Yes. I'm going to make the decision. And you got to rest there. You're not always going to be, and I'm grateful because what did it teach me? How to build teams. Yeah. Because I couldn't do it all myself because that's my nature. Like, well, okay, you don't do it, fine, I'll do it. Well, you can't, you can't, live, can't really do church that way. You can't really do life that way. So you had to learn how to, how, to be, how to have talent, and you got to let talent be, be talented and not be jealous. I couldn't be upset. Mike could sing better. Or Keith could sing better. Or they both played better. I couldn't be jealous of those things. you got to know, thank God, what I love is the sound of it coming together. Amen. you got to love kingdom sounds. 
And so we can't like be looking over and everybody else's fence and, and upset because they're getting this opportunity. They are called to it. And you may not be. And you got to love where you're called Amen. and call where, you, where, you, where you're at, like, right? Be there. Well, does that make sense? Like, yo, is it with me? It's just, just is it, can't we show like real life? Is that okay? Like, this is real stuff, you know? Wish I could, but couldn't. Just couldn't do it. I remember when we were building and, and, and we were specking out what the, 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 the sound system looked like. I remember distinctly sitting in here. I would come in and, and we're, we're doing the soundboard and how we're going to do the stage and wiring. And I remember thinking, I remember distinctly sitting in here going, all this stuff is not even for me. Mike Burns is going to use all this and I'm not going to even know how to do it. But I'll tell you, it was like what it felt like, at least I imagine what it felt like for David to gather all the stuff for Solomon to build the temple. There was just as much joy in it as it was building it myself. In church, what we have to realize is that some of us are in a stage where now, where you were on the platform, now you're supposed to be the platform for somebody else. And it's very much the things that you're going to begin to see here as well. As you see other people take the platform, don't be jealous and think, what's my turn? It is the season of where we are as a church. If you look around, it is a season where the Lord is going to raise up that next generation of leaders, and either we throw stones at them or we build relationships so we can help them. But we can't have jealousy and God in the same house. We got to figure out whether it want to be a kingdom church or whether it want to be a church that wants a kingdom. Because we can't have growth and control at the same time. Amen. It's his church, and he builds it the way he wants. And it is sometimes a little tougher looking in the mirror and seeing that your hair is grayer or way grayer than it used to be. <laughs> My children remind me of that. I remind them it is because I'm wiser than you. you know, that's why. We did, we did. We messed with each other. But we love that. And church, listen, I promise you, we can't be jealous of what the Lord, when he, he brings in or has talented people, and they rise in their giftings, we got to celebrate it. Yes. Amen. And when it's difficult, and it will be, you got to go in. It doesn't mean that you have lost your value, your place. It means your assignment has changed. Yes. And you got to find that. Quick, quickly find what your new assignment looks like. If not, you'll end up holding on way too long, and then you'll choke out the life of it. Oh, we, we still good this morning? We still there? And so then we start looking at them. These are these common types, and then they produce. What are these effects then? So we've seen the types, but then what do they produce? Like, Because this is, it, it all becomes a plan. Then like, what is it going to produce? And here's the first thing it produces is trust issues. After being hurt, we struggle trusting others, and, and we fear harm. So now, like, now because of a relational wound that, that's not healed, now I've got trust issues. So now we don't trust anybody. And what I love is in Christian life, what we do is, I don't trust people, but I trust God. I bet you're a lie. I bet you're not telling the truth. How in the world do you trust God and not trust people when you, well, they're not God. Well, you trust God to work through people. You trust him. You, you, you can't sit there, well, I, just, I, don't, I don't need people. Really? Come on, let's not do this. We need people. We need each other. I need you. You need me. It's kingdom. It's why the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches how to pray. You know what he didn't say? My Father. What did Jesus say? Our Father. Community. We need each other. It's a deep place of maturity spiritually when you stop being a me and you start being a we. Our Father. And so trust issues become effects from relationship. The second one becomes emotional pain. Feelings of sadness and anger and resentment accompany a relational wounds. And in our young people, this is the place where their emotional pain becomes absolutely so painful that they distract themselves with physical pain and we end up with cutting and some of these self-harmful behaviors. And I know like we go, well, why do they do that? Listen, I'm, I'm helping you and all I'm just executing is the, the biblical principle of gaining some understanding because you can't help if you don't at least communicate your understand or compassion. And it's so much, and whether I've never had that where I felt like I, I, I've hurt so bad emotionally that I wanted that I use physical pain to distract me. And so maybe you've not been there as well, but we do want like to hurt emotionally, and maybe we drink something yeah. or a lot of something, or we take something, 
or we, we put something up in smoke, whatever that is, we know what it's like to self-medicate. And cutting is just another form of self-medication that's not good. But I want you to hear it. I want, we have to communicate to our young people that we understand at least what they're going through and why they're doing it. It's not just because they're crazy, because they're hurting. And someone that doesn't know how to say it will communicate in a way that they can. And to our young people in the room that maybe you have friends or you're doing that as well and you're able to keep it hidden or whatever, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Pastor James is not here to condemn you. I came to say that Jesus knows where you hurt. He can heal you every single place you hurt. And I'm asking you to not hurt alone. I'm asking you to talk to somebody. I'm asking you if you want to, you can talk to Pastor James. I can't keep secrets from your parents. But I will be a confidential place where we can talk. And I promise you this. I, I, I promise I'm going to do a lot more listening than I will talking. But I'm asking you to do the same too. And I want permission to talk to you about Jesus who will heal you every place you hurt. And to my young people that have, that know the Lord, that have friends that are participating in things like this, be bold and be courageous and talk to them about Jesus. And pray for your friends, not just on your alone time, but literally grab their hands and tell them, hey, and pray right there. You'll be amazed at the power that happens right then. I'm encouraging you that you're in their life to not just be a sympathizer, but you're light in a dark situation that they won't talk to anybody else but you. You're a missionary right where you are in your school. Amen. And I'm encouraging you, asking you, be bold. Even if it's Pastor James, how do I do that? I'd love to coach you in how to do that. But you're there. Don't see yourself as a passive person. That's just a, you are there to make an impact in this world, and it's meant to be positive, and the Lord will use you right where you are with your friends. Here's this third one. It, it, I, it has an impact on our identity. Wounds can challenge our self-worth, leading to insecurity and then self-doubt. We've seen this play out over and over again, where now I don't, I don't feel like I belong. I've got wounds. This is now where we, we have things like, that, you know, where then it's, it's just, again, just like I, I don't even have like wealth. I don't feel like I'm worth anything. Crazy things happen here where the impacts our identity. And then finally, the biggest impact of our, of our relationship becomes spiritual struggles. This is when wounds come from people within our church or our family, and it causes us to question God's love or his presence in our lives. And this is now this common thing where we hear something called church hurt, where now because it happened in the church, now all of a sudden, you know, this is where we've got spiritual struggles because of relational wounds. And it's really, really key. And like any wound, if it stays open, it's destined to get infected, and it's de- that infection is destined to kill you. One more time, like any wound, relational wounds are no different. If it stays open, it's destined to get infected, and that infection is meant to kill you. Spiritually speaking as well, where it just now keeps getting infected, keeps getting offended, keeps getting injured, and so now you start navigating now how to protect the infection rather than the painful part of it. I got a hangnail on my, on my, on my finger, and it got infected. I don't know how it got infected, but all of a sudden, my finger like, swelled up, and it was like, and I'll tell you, like, I was going through my day, and I remember, like, I was, you know, and then all of a sudden, I clipped it on something, and I'm telling you, it brought me to my knees, because it's amazing how, like, just such a small thing, but when it gets infected, like, you touch, and I mean, it will, whatever you're doing, whatever you were doing that day, you can be busy doing right, but that will arrest your attention immediately until you deal with it. And so all this time, I'm thinking, Lord, I do not want to have to go to urgent care, have them dig in my finger or something. And so thank God's able to work on it and got that taken care of. But I'll tell you, like the pain you feel when you have an emotional, a relational wound that is infected, I promise you, every time somebody's going to touch on it. And it's why you have the, the visceral reaction that you have when somebody hits that issue. But I said this, we did not come to just discuss issues. We came to talk about overcoming, say overcoming. That's where we started, talking about overcoming. And so I want to talk about where we're landing today is overcoming relational wounds, and I'll leave you alone till next week. It's overcoming relational wounds. You have to start, and really in overcoming relational wounds, you have to start thinking about relational wounds in your life as spiritual things. 
Come on, stay with me. We still good? You got to start thinking of relational wounds in life as spiritual things where you're connecting to the God of the universe and accessing his power to overcome rather than your ability to do it yourself. It's a spiritual thing. Even secular psychology has begun to realize that the only way to heal from relational wounds is you have to get spiritual about it. And you cannot because they realize it's bigger than you and that you're bigger than just what you see. Spirit, soul, body. And relational wounds are one of those things you have to get spiritual about. We have to go to God to bring something into our lives that gives us the resources and ability to heal. And Jesus gave his life. Stay with me, church. This is big. Jesus gave his life on the cross and rose again to forgive us. But he also gave his life and rose again to cleanse us from the sins that we committed. Jesus also died and rose again to cleanse us from the sins that have been committed against us as well. He came to cleanse you wholly. He didn't just come to cleanse you from what you did. He came to cleanse you from what was done to you. And the crazy part is we've been schizophrenic in our relationship where we've embraced the forgiveness of what I've done, but we refuse to accept the cleansing on the other side of what's been done to me. Oh, no, no, no. They're going to pay that debt back. I was waiting. My dad was going to tell me he was sorry for what he said to me. He was going to take it back. He was going to say, son, I should have never said that to you. He was going to rue the day he ever did. The crazy part was that was the condition of me being whole, even though that was not ever going to happen. And some of us are waiting for a debt to be paid that has already been paid. You are looking for someone to say something or do something, and you get retribution when Jesus has interrupted your plan and said, I paid it. Look at my hands. Look at my side. Look at my feet. I took care of that. No, 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 Jesus, now, 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 no. Now, that works for my debts, but that doesn't affect the debts that, that, because they, no, they owe that to me, and I paid it. Oh, no, no, no. And it wasn't until I waited for my dad. So all I knew, every part of what I was doing was about him. Every part was about not want. I want to change my name to like make him rue the day. So here I'm walking down, same thing, going to Cal Poly, graduating, walking down Grand Avenue toward the stadium. And the Lord reminds me, James, by the way, just so you know, even though you got your nice degree, you can still be poor. You're going to need me. And James, oh, by the way, now you got your degree, you still look like your dad. James, by the way, since you got that, you may be nothing like him, but you can still be lost, which is what you are. Right there was on the floor over on Ara Vista with people around me and all their bare feet dancing and worshiping, and I'm on the floor (laughs) under the presence of God. And the Lord brings these things back up in my life. And I said, why in the world are you bringing this up again? Real key, we'll never forget it, James. Salvation is free, but healing hurts. James, I paid every debt that you owed. James, And I paid every debt owed to you, including that one that you're holding from your dad. And I'm grateful to God that because of that, he allowed him again to restore that relationship. And I'm so grateful because I love my dad more his last 60 years than I did my first 14 with him. Love being able to see him all the way until he went home to be with the Lord But that does not happen until I released him from his debt that had already been paid. Come on, y'all still with me this morning? You're staying with me? So four things I'll give you. I think I'll give you four or five things, I guess, and this is where I'll end and then I'll get until next week. And the first part of overcoming, say overcoming. 
I want to be clear. So every week you've gotten tools that are geared at overcoming. We haven't just been discussing issues. We've been talking about biblically how to lay it out, Jesus and the Bible and mental, how to walk in it. Don't be the nice, neat garage. <laughs> Build a house. Fix a problem. Use the tools that he's given you. Can't trust people with pristine tools. Those are called stores. Carpenters have used tools. You hearing me? That makes sense? Okay. Even if it's a red craftsman, when you need it, you got to use it. Say a little Andy here. All right. So it's, so first one is you got to acknowledge the pain. Acknowledge the pain. Oh, I hear somebody already like, no, yes. Yeah, because you can operate in truth, spirit and in truth. You got to acknowledge the pain. You're not surrendering to it. You're acknowledging it, that it's there. Psalms 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God understands our pain and is near to us in the moments of our heartache, and we bring our hurts to him because we're trusting that he deeply cares for us. I'm not surrendering. I'm not bowing my knee to it, but I'm not going to also put on the mask and say, Lord, it doesn't hurt. Father, I am hurting. And I'm trusting that you, because I cannot find anything else to distract me from it. I need you. You said you're close to the brokenhearted. I'm grateful that you're close to the brokenhearted. Amen. Here's the second one is you got to embrace the foundation of love. The second key to overcoming relationship is you got to embrace the foundation of love. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It is not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. Uh, it is not self-seeking. Uh, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. When we strive to embody this kind of love, we create an environment, listen, we create an environment where our wounds can heal and where our relationships can be restored Amen. when you embrace love. Melly, I'm just about done, so if you want to make your way, appreciate it. Third one then is you got to seek reconciliation. Seek reconciliation. God calls us to be peacemakers and seek reconciliation. Matthew chapter 5, 23 Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and then remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Now, reconciliation may require humility or patience or persistence, but it's a vital step in mending broken relationships. Now, here's what I want to say because I can, I can feel kind of some of the tension like, mm. Because some of you got some anxiety, real anxiety, that, that's about like thinking about calling that person or how to like re-engage that person. So I want to like say that in the parameters of this, I want to warn you that healing from relational wounds is not reconciliation at all costs. So let me be clear, it's not reconciliation at all costs. You have to know when to walk away from toxic and or codependent relationships. You got to know when, and that is where the discernment of the Spirit comes in. You don't have to reconcile in a toxic relationship like that, but you do have to reconcile yourself to what God has. You got to operate in reconciliation, and so it does not mean at all costs. It doesn't mean that you, you got to go to that. You do not have reinduced that relationship back in your life, but you do have to be open to letting the Lord heal you and reconcile you. Does this make sense? So that you've not been changed by that relationship in the way to something that is not in God's image where he's going, where are you? So it's really key here. So I want to be clear. It's not reconciliation at all costs. If it's toxic, if it's codependent, don't do it. You got to know when they're to walk away from it. And it's okay. It's absolutely okay. You can walk away from that. Here's a fourth one then. You got to trust in God's restoration. Jeremiah 30, 17, God promises, but I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. God is in the business of restoration, and there's no wound that's too deep for his healing touch. We have to trust him. We got to believe that he'll bring us to wholeness. Somebody say wholeness. 
the man at the pool of Bethesda, again, he looked and he wanted to get his legs healed. And Jesus didn't ask him, do you want to walk? Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? Because Jesus doesn't know how to do partial healings. He has this thing about him that says it is finished. His goal is for you to be whole, to be wholly healed. He's letting him know walking is not your biggest issue. I want to make you whole. Hey, church, listen, I want you to understand something. And thank God he doesn't just do it. He doesn't just heal you on the wound that you're focused on. He does a whole scan and says, I want to do the whole thing. I want you to be whole. Somebody say whole. Whole. He, he wants you to be whole. And then comes the fifth one, and this is where it gets really the real issue. You got to use forgiveness as a path to healing. You got to use forgiveness as a path to healing. Matthew 6, 14, and I just want to just preface this as it's not red letter on the screen, but it's red letter stuff. So here's the words of Jesus. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Say will. Will. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will not, not might not, will not forgive your sins. And so in the words of Jesus, let me just put it in, in, the, in the newest King James Version. King because of what he's made us, kings and priests, not ego. That being hurt is not a valid reason for you not to forgive. I know, I know, that just stinks, don't it? That just stinks. But in, in, in Jesus' eyes, in the eyes of God... Being hurt is not a valid enough reason for you not to forgive. You don't understand how I've been hurt. You don't understand the level of forgiveness God had toward you. God is not asking you to do anything that he didn't do. See, there's happened this one day, God, his own son, was like on the side of this crowded road. I know we saw like the typical, like uh, uh, the, the, the normal, like uh, crucifixion deal where it's up on this hill and this majestic and not so. We go to Israel, it was Passover, crowded, hot summer. The whole thing was about intimidation. So they weren't crucified way up on a hill. They were crucified like on the side of the road. Because have you wondered how everybody heard everything he was saying from so far away? Remember all the stuff? Oh, he's, cry he's crying out to this person. Jesus wasn't yelling up there. They were close enough they could hear. It was meant to intimidate for you to have to walk by this nude body, pierced and beat. It was the Romans' way of keeping them in subjection. So you didn't get a reprieve from it. You had to walk by it. It was during Passover. It, the, the city is busy. And while he's hanging on this cross for something that he did not do, Jesus himself, for something he did not do, having just by the word could have legions of angels come down and, and remove him, start it all over. Jesus has the nerve to say, Father, forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing. And you think your thing is enough to stand before God for you to tell the Lord, I just don't forgive. I'm just not that person. The most dangerous human being that exists is someone that will not forgive. And we dance around it in church like it's like one of the spiritual gifts that you can like have or not have. I came right to your front room to let you know you are hurting yourself when you do that. You are putting yourself in a prison of bitterness. And you think you're rejoicing, clapping because that person that you're peering through those bars at, they're trapped. I got them. And until you say it, I'm not letting you go. But just take three steps back and then look to the left and right. And I think you'll see those bars wrap around you and not around them. And so to the person that, that you have to qualify how you forgive, I just want you to know you are absolutely biblical in error. It is absolute pride because forgiveness is a choice. And you are choosing 
to be disobedient because of your hurt. Forgiveness is instant. Trust has to be earned. But forgiveness is instant. And we don't get off. We don't get a pass. You don't get to say, I was so hurt like God understands. Really? You think the Lord's going to compare you and look at Jesus and go, now, now I'm supposed to understand what you went through as opposed to what my son went through. You were both innocent, right? Looking at his innocence, even in his innocence, he asked for forgiveness for the people that were absolutely torturing him. Oh, yeah, right, right to our front door. Right, I'm going to lose pastor of the year today. But we're going to get free today. Because I'll tell you this, in my personal life, it is difficult for me to trust someone that doesn't forgive. Because they want to hold you captive. And I won't say whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm nobody's prisoner and neither are you. Let them stay in their own prison of unforgiveness. You keep walking free. And so I came today because I realized that when we talk about relational wounds, it is one of those unique ones of these things we've been talking about that is a spiritual issue. So I remember there's a, we sing the song, Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He asked for alms and held all his palms. And this is what Peter did say, right? Silver and gold have I none. Remember that? But such as I have, give to thee. Uh, Silver and gold, I have enough. My need is met according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I'm not willing to say silver and gold have I none. Silver and gold my father has, and he's met my need every day of my life. But what I also have, I want to give to you. What I have been given is I know what it's like to forgive, and I know what it's like to walk free. And what I came today to do is for the ones that are brave enough to say, Pastor James, this thing has been on me. Like, it's been a thing. Pastor James, like, I, I, I want, but it's just been hard. I'm challenging you today to not be a functional person in disobedience. What I do is I have the ability to pray for you from what, because you can't get what you don't have. And I'm so grateful he's given me the ability to forgive. It's been difficult. It's been hard. But I'll tell you, I know he's done a work in my heart. And I'm grateful for it. And so today I came to to end the service then, or at least in this part of the message, is I want to pray for you. As your pastor, I want to pray for you. Because sometimes I, I have to preach from a place of, of absolute, like where I'm just, I'm learning and I've learned with you. Sometimes I'm able to preach from a place of authority. This is one of those places where I can come for the authority. Because I've had to go, Lord, I don't want to forgive, but I have to. Because obedience to you, you, what you place in me is stronger than this. And so if you're here today, right where you are, and this has been a thing, do not walk out those doors or those doors or those doors the same. Not when the Lord has made you an offer. You can walk free, but it's going to take a step. There's a woman that was bent over for 18 years and all she could see was her feet. Could look in the mirror to see that beautiful face God gave her. All she had to look at was her feet. Some of you have been living in unforgiveness so long, all you're looking at is your feet. You can't even stand up straight. And so today you're going to stand up straight. And right where you are in this room, I'm asking you to be so courageous. And forget about whoever's looking because who cares what they look? Who cares if they're looking because they ain't with you when you're going through hell at home anyway. So stop letting them have that kind of space in your life. And just before holy God and symbolically, and symbols are important, right where you are, would you stand and say, Pastor James, it's me. I'm, I'm saying this thing has had me and I'm coming today to say, Lord, break this thing off of me. I've been holding someone 
to a debt that Jesus paid and I came to walk free. If that's you today, would you be so courageous, so bold to stand to your feet right now, right where you are? Every person, every person, don't dare. Don't miss a God moment. It's symbolic. It absolutely is. Oh, man, bless you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Come on, right there. Come on. It's okay. It's okay. Come on. Come on. It's, it's real. And if family can't be real together, then what in the world are we doing? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Bless you for your people. Thank you for those that are like And so I want to pray for you. And I believe in making prayer circles. It means I kind of walk and we just encircle you and believe God. So I just want to pray for you the way I do every day of the week. And so, Father, I thank you for my brothers and my sisters, those that have had, Lord God, just the weight of this thing that is absolutely stolen from them, sleep and joy and peace. And in Jesus' name, I command the work of the enemy to end and to stop in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, of the breakthrough for my friends and my family, Lord God. That, Father, no weapon formed against them will prosper. They continue living lives that are free from the powers of sin and death and the devil and unforgiveness. I thank you, Lord, for breaking every single chain that would try to hold them. Father, it's a new day. It's a new season. And, Father, you've spoken a word. You've said, what I have, I'm going to give to you. Give them, Lord God, forgiveness. Give them breakthrough in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, for breakthrough, Lord God, for my friends and my family, God. I thank you, Lord, for what you continue to do in them, Lord God, that the plan of the enemy will not take root, that every foul weed of discouragement, every foul weed of dissension, every foul weed that has tried to take root, that, God, you pull it up from its root, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And thank you for planting seeds of righteousness and abundance and freedom like never before. Thank you, God, for doing a work in them, Lord God. Thank you because the truth has produced honesty, Lord God. And God, there's a reward in truth, Lord, that when we come to you, Lord God, in spirit and in truth, that you break every chain, Lord God, that you destroy the plan of the enemy. Thank you for freedom, Lord God, because we cannot give what we do not have. I thank you, God, for people that are strong in the Lord and the power of his might for giving and using it as a weapon, Lord God, to come against the plan of the enemy. That Father, that the enemy not have a root cause in our hearts, Lord God, to keep us holding people in bondage when you said you came to set the captives free, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because you have anointed me to speak freedom to the captives, God. I thank you for breaking the chains, Lord Jesus, over the lives of every person that is bad, this thing, this unforgiveness, this rage in them, Lord God. Now, Father, turn their mourning into joy, Lord God, into gladness, Lord God. Replace, Lord God, the spirit of heaviness with the spirit of joy, Lord God. Help songs sound better. Let their worship go deeper, Lord God. Let their prayers and their vision expire wider in Jesus' name. Because the healer is in the house. And because you've declared no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Don't tell me he can't do it. Don't tell me he can't do it. Don't tell me he can't do it. In my life, in my family's life, don't tell me he can't do it. I've seen it. You're going to see it. I've seen unforgiveness turned around. Don't tell me he can't do it. And I give you thanks, Lord God, for every one of these courageous ones today that are standing in this room, ones that are standing in the living room, wherever they would be, I thank you for the reward of obedience being theirs, that you, Lord, are doing the work. And I give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.